Uh, thank you very much. And um, I should mention, three years ago, I spoke with Dr. Code and Dr. Arata on Lyme disease. But it took them three years to invite me back, so I guess I didn't leave much of an impression with them. <laughs> um, I'm considered a bit of a, what do you call it, uh, inc incompetent zealot. That's what they call me. And I've got to be very careful how I say that, because one time I said incontinent zealot. <laughs> uh, I'm talking about two things today, a little bit about Lyme. And how many people have heard my lecture before? Oh, this goodly number already. I'll have to keep my jokes clean, I guess, maybe, or give them out with the same jokes. Anyway, I got involved um, with uh, Lyme disease um, because I had a first case in uh, Agassiz, BC. And at this time, I had a medical student, and I said, I want you to work this case up. It was a rash, arthritis, and general illness with flu-like symptoms and cervical adenitis. His conclusion was that it's a flu, liberal arthritis, and ringworm. Ringworm is what he called it. But I said, okay, suppose there was an insect in the middle of that circle. He got it immediately. He said it's, it's a tick. Fortunately, he was one of the few students that ever recognized a ring rash being Lyme disease, the everything by migraine's rash. That's how I got my first case. My second case was in Hope, 25 miles away, a boy went to uh, um, chop uh, uh, tree planting, and um, he got a bite at 8 o'clock, uh, went to work at 8, 10 o'clock. He noticed the irritation around his abdomen, and uh, the first aid man took a counterclockwise action and bro naturally broke it off. In exactly uh, 48 hours, he had a perfect dime-sized circle, and that was Lyme disease. And uh, just two months ago, I was cleaning some property, and uh, I got a bite myself. And as you may, some of you may have seen it on Facebook, I got a perfect rash. So now I'm not just a Lyme treatment <laughs> center anymore, but I have, I have now classified myself as a Lyme patient. But I treated it quickly with um, two things. One was cannabidiol hemp oil. And within two, two days, the rash went from bright red to a light fading pink. I knew that that would had a definite antibiotic effect because I had been doing some research. But um, I'm going to go quickly into, um, into a little bit of my Lyme studies, and uh, then, then I'll go how it blended into the use of uh, cannabidiol as a treatment for a potential Lyme disease, not just acute and chronic, but topical as well. So next picture. I'll just go through that very quickly. Uh, background, description, co-infections. Co-infections are very much of a factor, and uh, we don't really do much studying. But uh, uh, I, I taught for five years at UBC Medical School about family practice and Lyme disease, but it did not receive the favor of a lot of specialists, and so I was uh, discontinued there at UBC. However, I just started to um, teach at the naturopathic medical school at the Boucher Institute because they were very interested in what I was doing. And at their conference, they said that your knowledge has got to be transferred to our medical students. And I have been there now five years in a row. I also have talked at Toronto at their naturopathic medical school, and they're quite impressed. But unfortunately, uh, the only place you can uh, get a prescription for a naturopathic physician, it is British Columbia, and we are a bit of a pioneer in it. But they can write prescriptions, and I teach them about giving IVs, so the way that, that they only have a choice because they cannot put in a PIC line because naturopathic uh, physicians cannot order a PIC line. They can get a PIC line in the States for about $800. But I teach them about the quick way, which is called a hip line or pick line, which is an intravenous that anyone can do, and the naturopathic physicians can do it. And they can give the uh, IV four days on and three days off. And that's equivalent to a daily dose of ceftriaxone. But that's what I'm teaching to the naturopathic medical students. And um, I, ran, I ran into a few today who have taught, and I've seen some patients, quite a few patients today, who have received the benefits from the naturopathic physicians because there's still a tremendous fear factor of treatment of Lyme disease by my own profession. 
Uh, next slide. Um, just to quickly bring you, I, I came from uh, my mother and uh, grandmother and uh, grandfather and grandmother lost everything during the First World War, and they had four daughters, and my mother was here, and the four daughters, he went bankrupt after the war because he put everything into the stock market, and he told my two oldest daughters to come to Canada. The oldest one got married, came to Canada, and their grandson became a doctor. My mother came to uh, Vancouver and went to Denman Island, and I became a doctor. And the two other two doctors, there's four doctors in our family, and I just found this all out. I thought they were all PhDs in Japan, but they were all MDs. By some fortuitous situation, we all became doctors, maybe by chance or in some genetic pattern. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, he'd be a samurai in Japan if he, she hadn't, uh, he hadn't gone bankrupt. Uh, next. That's the farm that they worked on. Next. My dad was a photographer. Next. My, this is my mother here and the oldest sister who came from Japan. This is me. I had more hair then. My dad, and this is her husband, and, two do and uh, his son became uh, a doctor. Next. Just a quick view, next, next. Um, during the war, as you know, we, we were interned as a, a threat to national security, and we went to East Lillooet. It's just opposite the river on the east side of Lillooet, BC. And uh, for us, it was a frightening situation. We were suddenly um, a threat to the national security. We were finding that we were very um, much uh, isolated. Uh, condemned, we lost all our friends, and uh, coming into this area, my father was taken away, and uh, he was um, taken away, and we didn't know where he went. And for, for a whole week, we didn't know where he was. And we feared the worst, because we thought he had been killed or, or imprisoned someplace. But he was up in the Marine Building, and he was there just for a short period of time, and then he disappeared, we didn't know where he went. But he went to Jasper as a work crew, uh, as a, in, in the roads, high roads. So when I go through BAMP, I think, gee, my dad uh, was forced to come here and it brings back uh, sad memories. Uh, next, uh, we went from Lillooet to Vernon and there my sister got extremely ill. She got extremely uh, ill to the point uh, she was having shortness of breath, cough, going very pale. And my mother and father were um, uh, herbalists from Japan. There was no antibiotics in those days. So she had the usual treatment of ginseng and weeds and everything else, didn't improve. Dr. Alexander came up and said, look, she got double pneumonia, we got to get to the hospital. And uh, we were told that after one week in being in the hospital, and if you know Vernon, it's the army base school and the, or the army base hospital in the school. And I saw my sister deteriorate so rapidly, the doctor said, finally, after one week, she's going to die and we want you to be prepared. We went to the Anglican church and said our final prayers for our, our sister, and they, um, that night, the landlord came from here, and we were staying in this house here, said you go to the hospital right away. We went there, and the doctor said, well, your sister's situation is about the same, but we'd like you to accept the fact that we have received a drug <coughs> called penicillin, and it has not been used by a civilian, and she'll be the first civilian to get it, and the, uh, the uh, credentials committee said that your sister is the sickest person. So initially they said, my mother and father said no, because people had died with acute anaphylactic shock, because the penicillin was so impure in those days. So anyway, um, I told my mother and father, penicillin is, comes from a mold, it's not a chemical. So they said, okay, let's go for it. And within 48 hours, my, my sister was who intubated in the deep coma. She came back to talk to us, but she was in a sort of a confused state. So that was my first experience with something medical. And uh, I said to my mother and father, I want to become a doctor, but we were financially without a penny in, 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 because of the internship. So she said, you should think of something else. And in, 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 well, in Vernon, uh, and one incident happened. Well, we were in Lillooet, a fellow died uh, with abdominal injuries, and he was screaming because he had fallen, but there was no doctor in Lillooet at that time. And again, I said to mom that I want to become a doctor, and he said, no, just forget about it. But the seed of becoming a medical doctor was implanted. Uh, so anyway, my sister came back. Uh, next, please. And survived. It took a whole year to recover. Next. 
I was very fortunate when I went to Vancouver to meet a Dr. R.B. Kerr. He was the head of internal medicine, and uh, he wanted somebody to live in and be a big brother to three of his sons. Next. There's his three sons. Charlie's a cardiologist. He's an um, ozone expert, and he's a geologist. And I became their big brother. I was bigger than them at one time. <laughs> <laughs> I got short-handed when they hand out tall, I guess. <laughs> Anyway, uh, they, become, uh, be, they became part of my family, and it was because of Dr. Kerr, who saw my interest in medicine, he said, you like medicine, don't you? I said, I want to, I've always wanted to go in. But uh, I said, a financial state doesn't allow it. So he said, you go into medicine, and don't worry about a thing. So it wasn't his, his uh, speaking to me. I never would have become a doctor. Uh, next. I went to a place called Br uh, Braylorn. I don't know if you know it or not, but it's a tiny little mining town. And the first thing I had was uh, going up a road that was very uh, difficult to get to. And I got there, and the doctor said, what took you so long? I said, I had to clear the road of rocks. You, and the road's closed. You won't be able to go back. And he was supposed to go on holidays. So he took me to his airport. And I said, he said, OK. And I got uh, somebody in ab uh, an abdomen in the hospital with severe abdominal pain. And I got a delivery that just about due. So I thought, gee, and then he took off. I never felt so alone. Here I'm out of internship and facing going to the hospital, and what am I going to face? This was the hospital here. I went to the hospital and saw this boy. His white count was astronomically high, about 18,000 white count. I did a rectal examination. I could feel a mass, oops, I could feel a mass in the right lower quadrant. So he, he had a ruptured appendix. But there was no way I can get any helicopter in there. The roads were all closed, and the, the weather was uh, too dark and, and too uh, formidable for any helicopter to come in. So I took an appendix out of that kid. It took me three hours because he had some gangrenous areas. And I had a surgeon supervise my bowel anastomosis because around the appendix, it had become necrotic. And that's why he had the, uh, a palpable mass. So that was my first challenge in family practice when I got out of my internship. So I thought, wow, I'm good God. I thought I'm going to kill my first patient. The next night. Next night, the doctor, uh, a nurse called and said, oh, you better get here right away. There's a delivery coming. And uh, I went there, and I heard the baby crying. Ah, well, this is going to be all over. So I said, uh, what does Dr. Robertson give for the baby? Oh, an oxytoxic drug to uh, stop the bleeding. I said, go ahead and give it. And I waited a long time, and I kept tugging on the cord. And all of a sudden, I fit the albumin, and there was a twin. I could feel movement. And I thought, oh, no. And, and I, I tried to force open the cervix, but it was town tight. I couldn't get it to relax. And this, uh, Dr. Um, uh, Brian said, try ether. I phoned him. I said, I've got a problem. I've got a uh, uterus tight around a second twin. He said, use ether. I used ether, and this patient got extremely ill, started to throw up and, and uh, gag. As the ether was very nauseating. And so um, I said, you know, uh, I've got to cut cut that womb, and i got to just take my chances because I, I, I can't wait. So anyway, he, um, uh, he said, cut it, and you'd have to just pull the baby right out, which I did. And I pulled the baby out, and she started to bleed, really bleed, because I had cut the uterine artery, because I couldn't see what I was doing. And I said to her, I said, um, you know, I'm going to have to put the sutures in blind. I've got to put big sutures in there blind, and I'm just going to have to pack it tight. And he said, you may not have babies again. She said, that's OK. I promise I'm not going to have sex again after this. <laughs> so. Anyway, the, two, the twins went to school in Hope. Next, next picture. In Hope, that's where I started to practice. And actually, after having a, um, a ruptured appendix and complicated twin delivery, I had a fellow who fell in the, in the um, legion and, and banged his head, and he was paralyzed on the right side. And I knew he had uh, hemorrhage on the contracu injury. So uh, I got that off, but I had an RCMP officer holding his head while I put a burr hole in, and it was a carpenter's drill I had to get the, the hematoma, a subdural hematoma out. And I did it, and he fainted. This cop fainted, and he was landed on the floor, back of his head, and he's bleeding away and convulsing on the floor, as if I didn't have enough troubles. So after those three events, I thought, gee, medicine is easy after this. And there it was. <laughs> so I ended up in Hope, and next picture. That's my wife, and two, two, uh, two. I had three. We hadn't planned three, but 
we went to Christina Lake and she forgot her pills and I have poor control. <laughs> with my poor control, we ended up with three. <laughs> Don't tell my youngest son that though. Uh, next, uh, fishing in hope. Next, I took a kick at the political ta cat and I didn't like it. Uh, you're a doctor, you're up in the top of the totem pole. In the, as a politician, I found out you're at, uh, under everybody else. You're at the bottom, you know, nobody wants to have anything to do with you. Uh, just so I gave it up. Next, please. Uh, my home in Vancouver, and I saw, uh, I was using that as a Lyme clinic for uh, my, my practice. Every Wednesday I was in Vancouver uh, doing family practice just for Lyme. And I saw 3,000 people before uh, I lost my license. Next, my, my family celebrating. Next, anybody know that person there? Who said that? Good for you. That's Bobby Orr, and I was, uh, I was a team uh, physician for the uh, hockey school in Vancouver Island, uh, near Mill Bill Bay. Mill Bay, Bill Bay. Is a, the college there. Next, Shimaki, next. No, just the doctor's tournament. Next. Oh, I hate to brag, but I was given an award for teaching. Uh, for Dr. Bob Willard appreciated the years that I had given for educating students. And next, well, the dean of medicine was very proud of what I was doing, although I can say that uh, I have people who still uh, negate what I'm doing in Lyme practice, and now, uh, with the promotion of uh, hemp cannabidiol, I've got double <laughs> hatred. <laughs> uh, well, they might as well hemp me for a lot of things. It's one, one, what's the difference between one or two? <laughs> ne next. Oh, I got the Queen's Award for community work. Next. Uh, Ernie Bomar was my bacteriology teacher, and um, uh, in my pre-med years, I had syphilis. Now, uh, correct, I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I had syphilis as a graduation thesis. And that knowledge has, has just really made me popular and knowledgeable about immunology and bacteriology. And I'm, I'm conducting search, research, as you know, people know, and I'm getting success, and hopefully it might be the answer to Lyme disease. I'm talking way over my head. But I'm real optimistic about it. I'll explain this later. Uh, next, my favorite daughter, granddaughter, and I'm supposed to be talking about ticks, not my family. <laughs> now, uh, the incidence of uh, ticks are not like this anymore. Much, much worse than that. There's a cluster I'll show you a little later with 15,000 approximate ticks in one little bush. To give you an idea, each female tick can lay 3,000 on the average eggs numbers. 3,000. In two years, those 3,000 will lay eggs, females. 3,000 times 3,000 is 9 million in two years. What's going to happen in four years and six years? We've got billions of ticks out there, and we have moose that are actually picking up all these ticks, and they're exactly being exsanguinated. They come out, they're called white ghosts. They get, lose their blood, and they lose all their blood to the point they can't survive. And they come wandering into um, places like Grand Forks. There's two moose that came in wandering into the town. And they're not looking for food. They're looking for help. And their bodies were just totally saturated. They killed the moose and buried them. But they're looking for help. And this is not just happening there. I've been right across Canada every year with lecture. I ask how many people here have Lyme disease. Fif minimum of 50% of, of uh, people that say, I have Lyme disease. In Kingston, it was 75% had Lyme disease. And I've been right across Canada. I've only missed two provinces. One is Quebec and one is Newfoundland. But every place I've gone, even BC, Alberta, right across this country, there's massive numbers of ticks. And we have an epidemic. And don't let the infectious disease fool you into thinking that we don't have a problem. We have a major problem. The moose population has dropped 50% in North America. Why? Because they're being sanguinated by ticks. And many of the ticks found on these animals now have um, the Borrelia um, burgdorferi spirochete in, in the uh, Exodes pacificum on this coast, Exodes scapularis. Not only that, they're finding even the dog ticks are carrying it. And it's not just the um, 
the deer tick that are carrying the host spirochete, but it's uh, squirrels, chipmunks, and shrews. And it's not just ticks either. It's uh, mosquitoes, black flies, and um, uh, sand flies. They are potential carriers of this disease. So you can see the magnification just spreading. And we have now ticks surviving up until the Arctic Circle. But the establishment will tell you it stops at the border, on the Canadian border. I'm not kidding. They still say, we don't have any Lyme disease here. It's really ridiculous. It's almost criminal. And they are making a misdiagnosis. They are making a major misdiagnosis. Number one is MS. A lot of people with Lyme have MS. And I often say uh, to them when they come up, have you been diagnosed? Yes, I've been told I have MS. Why do they get better with antibiotics? They do. There's a certain percentage, not everybody, but there's a good percentage that do respond to antibiotics. Next, please. There's the life cycle on the uh, right-hand side. The uh, larva, nymph, the nymphal size is the size of a dot. So if you got bitten by a nymph, nymph, you would never know. And if your doctor says, if you haven't had a tick on you or a target rash, you do not have Lyme disease. And if, if your Lyme test is negative, you don't have Lyme disease. There's a major fallacy, major, major fallacy. That's the size of a dot. And they're just as infectious as the female tick that, that can, both, can both inf and, uh, infect you. So if they say you haven't been bitten by a tick, you don't have Lyme disease, it's highly erroneous. Uh, next, please. This is how big they get, as big as a, a bean, lima bean, and again, average 3,000 eggs. In two years, the 3,000 eggs will become 9 million. And 9 million, and two years further than that, times, that's 27 million. And we're into the billions of what we can get just from one single female. Now, that's just one single female tick can cause all those billions of, of uh, tick, surviving ticks. Next. I won't go through the cycle. You're all aware of the general cycle and the cautions you, you have to take and make sure you don't get uh, a bite and, and that you miss it. Because when you leave it in your body too long, that's how you get the infection. Next. The proboscis is like a barbed hook. And when it goes under your skin, the barbs are like that, under your skin. So if you pull, like the government says, traction, pull continuously. All that does is open up the barbs and it snaps off at the neck. And the danger to that is these mucosal areas, the glands are filled with infection. And it's not just uh, Lyme disease anymore. There's about 10 infections that you can include, and including the paralytic uh, fe tick fever. And they had an outbreak of that about four or five years ago, and they had three in the Okanagan and a couple of down the valley. But it's here, and we all have to be very, very careful. And if, it, if somebody tells you that they don't believe that it's here, have them contact me. I have a phone number that anyone can phone me, doctor, and I'm getting more calls. In fact, I ran into a few doctors I've uh, trained, and they were right here at this meeting. And if they have a case of uh, Lyme disease or any questions, I leave myself wide open, and uh, not just for doctors and nurses, patients. And with the naturopathic physicians being able to prescribe antibiotics and give IVs, it's a tremendous answer in British Columbia anyway for now. I've gone to the Boucher Clinic five years in a row. I have been to the one in um, Toronto on Shepherd Avenue, but they didn't get their license to, to prescribe antibiotics. Uh, next, there's the list of the drugs, uh, I mean infections that you can get. Top five is what I recommend that you get tested for. Bottom five are very rare, but there's another 10 more viruses and infections that you can pick up from a tick. So when I talk about co-infections, I'm talking about maybe 15 to 20 infections that you can get from one tick bite. And I've had people uh, get three or four infections, like, a, like these top four, in from one single bite. Next. This is the problem here. The eggs of the cyst is a survival form. And that can give you a lot of problems because the spirochete will die with any infection. Okay? The problem is the survival form of the egg. These can be frozen, thawed out, and it will give you a, a live spirochete. And this is what we have to be concerned about. And right now, um, we're doing some studies on the not only on the spirochete, we know that it's been killed, the biofilm is killed, now we are doing the eggs. If it kills the eggs, we'll be coming out with a medical journal uh, article. 
Um, this is an antibiotic, ceftriaxone, causing three, spir three uh, eggs to be formed by the, uh, this one single sp uh, spirochete. Next. The line is straight up. If you put one on top of another, it's going straight up like that. It's kind of scary, but it's true. It's going straight up. Next. Ehrlichiosis is going up in the middle of the 1993. The world warming is making a difference, and they're all surviving now. Next. Again, uh, this uh, doctor from a uh, medical student came down from England. He said, you're the only one in the Commonwealth that is teaching about Lyme disease. And she brought me this graph. And it's following the same pattern in England as well. And yet they're screaming for doctors to treat Lyme disease. Next. The warming of the world, effect of the world is going straight up. And that's what is causing the ticks to survive and causing a lot of problems. Next. This map now, I'll show you the one later. This black area now is already down this half. I'll show you the map. And it's also getting black on this side of the continent as well. Next. My first case was in Hope, and the second case, Harrison. A follow-up was done and all over. And you look at Machosin. Why Machosin? Because it's a place where the birds fly from one of the Strait states, come across, they land in Machosin, and they, they, they rest and they feed. That's why Machosin's got a high number of uh, ticks and, and uh, carrying the Lyme disease. Next. This was done by my uh, uh, friends, Dr. Banerjee and Kindry. Dr. Kindry was head of the, the Department of, of Infectious Diseases in the, um, for the uh, insects. And he and Dr. Banerjee did a lot of work and found ticks with Lyme disease. And this is all of BC. And yet we have a doctor saying there's no ticks, no Lyme disease in British Columbia. Next. My first case um, was here in Agassiz. The first previous seven, Burns Lake, Salt Spring Island, uh, Galliano, Kootenai in the Kootenai area, Cortez uh, Grand, uh, Island again, Oliver in the Okanagan, Nanaimo, and, um, well, in the central part of Vancouver Island, and Agassiz. That was my seventh case. And these are all confirmed cases. Next. Clinical presentation, if you're lucky, you'll have a bit thick bite, but if you get bitten by a nymphal stage, you wouldn't even know it. And all the symptoms of flu, uh, a muscle problems, fatigue is a very common denominator. And unfortunately, uh, Lyme disease can mimic any disease, and Lyme disease is a number one issue. Cognitive dysfunction, cardiac dysrhythmia, secondary depression. And the commonest cause of death in a Lyme patient is depression, because, I'm sorry? Okay. Uh, the commonest cause of uh, death in uh, a Lyme patient is still suicide, and I, I get People sending, my psychiatrist said, I've got nothing wrong with you, you're just mental, mentally ill. And they commit suicide. It's happening all the time. This is why I find it so urgent to get the word out and get the medical world to accept it. And I think it's starting to work because Dr. Wormster, who is an anti lyme patient or a doctor, he said, um, I mean, I'm changing my stats on the amount of uh, ticks, uh, infected people in the states from uh, 30,000 to 300,000. He jumped tenfold in one year. And I still think he's wrong. You could probably multiply, probably more like um, three million. Next. These are advanced rashes, but these are fairly ignored rashes because nobody's diagnosing Lyme disease. Next. This is the way you'll find them usually in the first couple of days. Uh, just like a dime size, that's where you find them. If you see that, that's got to be treated for Lyme disease. Next. Next. Axilla is very common. Next. Next. The groin is very common. The, the ticks seem to know where to go in the groin, on the axilla, and the back of the head. Next. 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 Back of the head is a very common spot. Next. So the diagnosis is a clinical diagnosis. And I have uh, had an interview with the federal government in Ottawa. I told them it is a clinical diagnosis. No lab test is required. And they have agreed. And they throw a letter to all the doctors. It is a clinical diagnosis. But what the college says and what the federal government says are two different things. Next, prevention. Check it very closely after you have any excursion into the, any wooded area. Next, 
Next. Removal of ticks is very important, and I won't have time to show you the graph, but look up Murakami tick removal under YouTube, and it's all there. And you can show it to your doctor if you, they ask for how to remove ticks. Next. This is the sub, uh, sub uh, intradermal, not subcutaneous, but intradermal. And the ticks will come out on its own. You'll see yourself, Murakami tick removal. You'll see a, uh, this actual uh, um, tick coming out on its own, untouched. Next. This is the tick uh, getting the, this is the blanching out of the blood. And that you get that white scaling. The, the tick is looking for uh, um, blood. And it's getting a, getting a xylocaine cocktail, I guess. Xylocaine and heparin cocktail. He's looking for a Bloody Mary, nothing, none of this xyl xylocaine. <laughs> ne next. This is the, the straw and the single knot. The straw goes there and the tick is touching the skin right here. You put a single knot, you grab it there, and you put continuous traction off and on, slowly. Not too tight, it'll let go. It'll take a little time, but it'll let go. Next, this is a, a, a dog, my, my daughter's dog, tick, straw, knot goes under the straw, and you get a single knot. At this stage, the tick will come off fairly easy. Next, treatment. Uh, most of you know, can follow that up. It's doxycycline is still a favorite, amoxicillin for children. Stage two requires something for the eggs as well as, as the spirochete. And uh, third stage, all require intravenous. Next, this was my first case in uh, Agassi. Next, you be, um, in a Victoria student, they called it uh, ringworm, gave him an antifungal. She had all a multi-organ system breakdown from head to toe. Next, she had next negative here, IgenX positive. CBC negative again, both uh, uh, Western blot and uh, uh, ELISA. Spinal tap positive, next. But after treatment by one month by a specialist saying that's all you need, it came back, it came back four months later. I told her one month of treatment after seven years of a Lyme disease is not going to get rid of it, and sure enough, the positive came back. Next, and this lady here, she was an accountant at a drugstore. Drug she was sick for four years. She was told, you have chronic Lyme disease, you've had one uh, uh, month of IV, you're cured. If it's anything else, it's all mental. Four years she suffered. I got another doctor to give her three months of IV, and now she phoned me at the end of the, that Christmas, and she said, four years she spent Christmas crying in bed. She couldn't participate in, in Christmas at all. But this, this is one Christmas she said she got up and did a turkey, wrapped presents, and, and enjoyed Christmas. She wrote to the college, but the college totally ignored her and her two children who wrote on my behalf. Next. Nurse, the same problem. Next. This is a high Herxheimer reaction when you initially start a kill. And you can get this not only with antibiotics, you can get it with a heavy dose of cannabidiol. They give you a killing effect, it releases a poison. Next. Now, um, as you people are aware, I treated 3,000 cases of Lyme disease before I lost my license. I probably treated about 7,000 on free advice to doctors, naturopathic doctors, nurses, and also patients who have no way to talk to people, and I'm always available to anybody here if they have, want a question about their disease. I've had 48 days of general practice, so I don't come uh, constricted just to ideas about Lyme. I'm fairly versed in family practice, and I've been teaching over 40 years with the family practice people. Um, to give you an idea, we'll look at that one here. In Canada, all this red is not from Canada. It's from labs outside the world. And it's high here because it, uh, I was giving uh, the patients the slip to go across the border or into England or wherever. They can do them. Same was here, Toronto doctors here, but they're no longer in practice now. They have had their license taken away. You can see here the Arctic Circle, right here. That's where it is in Europe. What happens here? It stops at the Alaska border and <laughs> the USA border. This is the, shows you the MS around the world, okay? This is put up by the MS International Foundation. They gave this to me. Canada has 340 MS per 100,000. This is not my figures. These are put out by the MS Foundation. And look where does it stop. It stops, at the, again, at the Canadian border, and a Canadian border. 
Alaska border. So I, show, I, I throw this at the skeptics, and I don't get an answer back, because they are liars. And we are misdiagnosing Lyme disease as MS, and fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue, you name it. We are misdiagnosing it, and I'm, I'm afraid to admit it. I'm, I'm, not, I'm afraid of, of saying it, but yet I get skeptics, I send them the thing, they never answer me back. Like, how can you look at this and say, what's wrong with our medical profession? Why can't they accept that? I didn't make that up. That comes from uh, World Health Organization for the Lyme. Uh, next. See that black that I showed you uh, that was 10 years ago? This is it now. This is Lyme disease in patients here. And yet it stops at the Canadian border. There's nothing above that. And yet half the Canadians are below the 49th parallel. Half the Canadians below the Fort Appel, and yet we, they get single or double figures, and yet every state along the coast here, of the northern part of the states, they report thousands. And some around here, in this area, 5,000 per year. Okay. Uh, next. Now, in my studies, and look at this first, this one, 5,000 eggs by one female. That was my medical students are counting them. One went to 10,000. So you could see, uh, multiply 5,000 times 5,000 and you're looking at millions. Okay, next. So anyway, a lot of my Lyme patients said, Dr. McCammy, we've been taking antibiotics, narcotics, anti-inflammatories, antidepressants, uh, anti-inflammatories, benzos, you name it. But when we took a puff of marijuana, I know you don't like us smoking pot, or smoking period, but when we took the pot, there was improvement. I said, well, okay, please use the cannabidiol paste, because that is non-psychogenic. Uh, and they said, yes, we felt better, okay? And so I was pleased. I was recommending it for the symptomatic control of Lyme disease, because there's so many symptoms from Lyme disease. It's a multi-organ system failure. And yet, cannabidiol attacked all the things like pain, arthritis, depression, anxiety, insomnia, nausea, and vomiting. It had an anti-cancer effect, and it has an anti-convulsive effect. And it's a bit, uh, I was talking to Bev, she's one of your co-workers here. She phoned me about a year ago, and I said, Dr. Murakami, I've got a son who's convulsing every day. All the anti-convulsive medicines don't work. I have to call the ambulance, take her to the uh, IV therapy, and I get to get some help because I have to posture him so he won't aspirate. So I, she phoned me a year ago and I said, well, I can only make a recommendation. I can't prescribe it. You can get some hemp cannabidiol, try two grains of rice twice a day. She phoned me six months later. He had not had a major convulsion since, no hospital calls, and no ambulance people. She's one of your workers here today. Her name is Bev. She, she said I could use her name. But there's lots of others like her. And this is all because of cannabis. Um, this is my brain tumor, 10 centimeters, and it grew from 2009 to 2013. Four years it grew 10 inches, one inch a year. And the neurologist that works at my office, Dr. Kastrikoff said, Ernie, that's got to be a malignant tumor. So I looked up malignant tumors next, and I met uh, with uh, a doctor, William Courtney, and he had a child, had a brain tumor, glioma, they were gonna do surgery, radiation, and chemo, and the mother and father says, no, we wanna use cannabis oil. And so, the doctor, family doctor said, okay, I'll go half with you, but if it doesn't work, would you take the surgery and the chemo? They, they agreed and signed an agreement. But in two months, the tumor was half size. Four months, it was just about, well, it's gone, and eight months, it was still gone. And I, when I first saw this, I said, how could a vegetable product kill a tumor? So I asked for the copies of the uh, MRIs, and I got them, and these, these represent the copies. I was uh, totally amazed that this could happen. That. So anyway, uh, at, uh, next, I uh, had four MRIs since my tumor was removed, and you can see it's pretty well gone, except for one spot here, seven millimeters, and it only grew another four and a half millimeters in two years. That was just last month. So I was very happy. So they asked me, what are you doing? I said, I'm taking cannabidiol. Oh, I don't believe in cannabidiol, but don't change a thing. This is, this is a specialist. <laughs> you know, it's really weird. 
Why can't they accept it? Because it's killing a lot of people because of our big divide in the medical world. Uh, next. Um, this will convince you there's something really wrong with our uh, stats. This is a moose, and uh, this uh, twig, I told you that now is a big, this is a 15,000 approximated, and they're just waiting for something to come by, and that moose you just saw, all those ticks rub right onto the moose's uh, fur. It's like a mat, it's like a vacuum cleaner. The moose are now dying, and 50% of the moose in North America are disappearing. Okay, and so this, where did, I, where did this picture come from? It just came from the Canada-Alberta uh, border, near, near uh, Alberta, that's where it was done. So it's here, and it's gotta be um, accepted. Uh, and so anyway, some of my Lyme patients said, Dr. Murakami, I've been taking cannabidiol for two years. I ran out of money, I couldn't afford the cannabidiol but my Lyme symptoms did not come back. So I said, that's great. I think there's an antibiotic effect. This is the standard in, in, in a tube. This is one millimole of cannabidiol, five millimoles of cannabidiol, and 10 millimoles of cannabidiol. Look at the difference. It had an antibiotic effect. I was never so happy when I saw that, and this is doxycycline in a therapeutic dose. So the effectiveness was almost as good. If he had gone to 15 millimoles, I probably would have surpassed the effect of, uh, of the 10. So I was very happy to do that. So now we're working on the biofilm, and biofilm was definitely destroyed. And now we're working on eggs, and so far in our study, the eggs are dying. So we may have the answer. I'm just keeping my fingers crossed that we may have the answer to the treatment of Lyme disease.